Hey there, YouTube. Welcome on back to Artichoke Dip. My name is Rob, Solo Tabletop Gamer. This is a video I've been, well, <laughs> hesitating to make. It's It's been a hard one, even for me. It's something I just, even I struggle with, and I know other people do. And so many game systems have it. It's a common thread between all of them almost even the mechanical side and how it relates to the rules and the game flow doesn't change doesn't matter what you're playing and i'm going to show you some examples of what i'm talking about rune quest castles and crusades basic fantasy nibiru The One Ring, Dragon Bane, and 5e even, yes, 5e even, currently 3e I'm playing right now. All of them have this common thread, this common concept into the game, and it can be almost like a void in the storyline if not done right it can slow down a game system or it can enhance your gaming session taking it in different directions that you would have never thought npcs now when i say that word if you're new to the gaming hobby and you don't know what i mean i'm not talking about the people that you see on TikTok stuff like that going right 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 no I'm I'm not talking about those I'm talking about non-player character a concept that is a very old concept in gaming something we've seen around the AD and D era because prior to that if the game master or dungeon master however you want to refer to that wanted to put what we call today an NPC into the game system, well, they would have to make these up ahead of time, planning, hoping that they could introduce them at the right time and not slow down gameplay or take away from what the characters would find enjoyable and what they liked about it. It's Or the other thing that I even forgot about, hoping they don't put the NPC out there and your party's nothing but a bunch of what they call murder hobos just <laughs> killing every single one of them that's put out there. There's another possibility there as well. But it's this fine balance. It's a very, very fine balance and it's something everybody, I think, in this hobby struggles with. All the way up to the very scripted, um, highly corporate funded um, games that we see streamed across not only YouTube, Twitch, and other ones. And these are the ones that have the actors that come in and they play the D&D &D games and all that. And you can just see there's huge corporate sponsorship behind it. I mean, you can see it. And you know, to a certain extent, there's some scripting in there. And with that scripting, they probably they have writers. They have professional writers to sit back and think of these concepts and ideas, maybe to help nudge the story towards a certain way to keep the people watching it or the audience entertained, keep them coming back for more, keep the ratings high, because that's what they want. And to help at that point, really, be able to sell their game and their products to the masses. It's the whole point behind them. But even large game groups, all the way down to us, the solo RPG gamers out there, we struggle with this concept. On the outside, it looked so simple. The resource seemed so vast. But 
once an NPC is put into the storyline, sometimes this is what slow things down. Sometimes you sit and wonder, what do I do with this NPC now? How does it react? How do my how does it react with my characters? And is it the correct reaction? Or is this going to alter the overall story arc of the entire game system? Ruining it, or, like I said, enhancing it. Oh, this is what we got to get into. And let me get my little disclaimer out of the way first. If you liked the video, let me know. Click the like button. And if you're new here, you just stumbled across my channel and found this, don't forget to click the subscribe, followed by the bell icon. When I do upload, you're going to get a notification. So, NPCs is... It's a necessary evil in role-playing games. It's why they're so prominent, why you see so many systems that offer them. Even one that I didn't bring, I don't have here on the table, but I will mention to you, Forbidden Lands is another one, Free League Publishing, that they have out there. But one thing I have to admit, that some of these game systems have put into place to help the game master or their solo player, is some key words, key takeaways that can add to the motivations of the NPCs bringing a life almost of their own to the game system, alleviating some of that off you, the player, or the game master, which is nice. That's a nice resource to have. But sometimes something happens. Sometimes the tables can be very limited. After a few game sessions, you notice the tables begin to seem not as vast, and the encounters not as authentic as they were at one time when it was new. Now it's just the same old bread and crackers, if you will. And there's resources out there to help with that. And that's what the scope of the video is going to be about. But the first thing I want to get into and talk about, I think, is the one thing that lacks with NPCs that makes a great NPC compared to just a cookie cutout blah NPC that's not even very, I'm going to say, memorable for your gaming sessions or the storyline. What do I mean by that? Here's a good example to give you. You're playing your session. Let's say this is set in a modern setting. Your characters are confronted by an NPC wearing a black business suit, and he pulls a gun. Your turn. What do you do? Well, from that information, there's a lot of things, options you have on the table that you could do with it. But if you're in a group setting, is this really that engaging to the characters? Or is this lacking? It's lacking depth. It's lacking everything other than it's just shit. Best way I can explain it to you. Compared to this description, as the characters make their way through the parking garage, it's at that point this figure in a black business suit comes around the corner gnashing his teeth and standing in the stream of sunlight that glares through the parking garage structure, reflecting off of his sunglasses. He reaches in to the suit coat, pulling the gun out, gnashing his teeth. You can hear the click of the gun as he raises it towards the characters and begins to tighten the grip on the gun as he takes aim. This paints, this paints a vastly different picture. 
not only into the players' minds, but even if you're playing solo, it helps give you more details. It's more cinematic, I'm going to say, far more descriptive. There's a lot more going on with that description rather than just it's an NPC wearing a black business suit that pulls a gun. Now what? There's more life breathed into this NPC through descriptions like that. There's a lot of variables that go into it that you can think about. Also, painting the picture for your characters. You know it's in the parking garage, which means there's going to be a lot of vehicles around. There will be a lot of areas to take cover from. On top of that, where this NPC is standing, he's wearing sunglasses and the sunlight that's streaming in, you can see it reflecting off of it. This too also indicates that your characters at this point have the advantage of the shadows to be able to use to their advantage. So there's a lot more going on here and we don't even know the NPC's name. We just see the action into which it brings and the difference in the two story elements and how they work. This is how I like to run my NPCs, even in my solo RPGs. This is where I emphasize, and I've made a video before about NPCs, NPCs are a great tool. And do not, whatever you do, really shortchange yourself on this, whether you're solo or you're game master. They can be a wonderful thing to use at the right time when needed. Not only challenging the characters, helping the characters, but also having a great resource that the characters may need. What do I mean by this? Well... Let's take this example. Let's say this is a medieval, like D&D type of setting. Your characters have abandoned the local cave system that they were in. The fighter is severely wounded and dripping blood and has fallen into unconsciousness. The other two characters have now been overwhelmed carrying any leftover gear that the fighter was carrying along with helping him and taking on the load of his body weight to get him back to the village for healing. Upon entering into the village, it's at this point they cross paths, glaring, not glaring, I'm going to say shimmering in the sun of the plate mail armor. And the first thing your character's eyes notice is the symbol of Paylor that has been engraved into the plate armor. The gentleman notices the wounds of the fighter and he asks, do you need assistance? Can I be of assistance to heal him? There's a difference there. You're, you're kind of painting more of a dramatic scene and you're actually adding more depth into the NPC. Rather than the characters left the cave system, they return to the village. The fighter is severely wounded and unconscious. They find a cleric and say, here, heal him. Okay. So we roll the dice. This is how many hit points later the fighter rejoins the group. We can move along further with that first explanation and say, to the character's amazement, they watch the cleric as he goes into a deep prayer, bringing his hands together. His hands begin to glow a white, vibrant light. And as he places his hands upon the unconscious fighter, they begin to see as almost like the breath of life has been put back into him. As he begins to stir and move, almost as if like death itself 
has been delayed, the fighter begins to slowly groan and open his eyes as to what is going on and looking confused at the cleric standing above him he looks up at the other two characters and recognizes their faces in confusion there's a difference here and i mean i'm just throwing i'm just spitballing these and throwing these out but i'm just trying to really convey the importance of detail when it does come to an npc and how to utilize them at the right time when they are needed or when they come into the storyline and instead of looking at them as a cookie cutout of stat blocks add more into them to add in to your game your solo experience or as a group at that point offering services that may be needed healing magic resupplies or coming in as challenges a brand new antagonist that may be needed in the storyline or it could be something far more sinister than that it could be something as an ongoing underground We'll say criminal organization that has been operating in these areas unknown to your characters and the others around it but a how do we put this um mischance meeting perhaps walking through the village streets or walking through that busy tavern a quince a quick glance of the eyes Maybe the nudge where he spilled his tankard of ale or what have you at that point has now started this snowball that just keeps rolling down the hill of misunfortunate events all going back to that one moment in the timeline of the story and this NPC having an axe to grind against the character with the character completely just unaware that they have done anything to provoke this but yet here they are drawn into it this is how i like to use npcs and how i like to put them into my stories i've emphasized on npcs before for some people they never use them they may find them just far too far too abstract for gaming i'm going to say all together whereas if others may just feel as they're too clunky as if they don't know am i doing it right or am i doing it wrong i just don't know well there's some resources out there that can help with this and there's some things that you can you can still get today to put into your library that will help with this and these are tools that are out there for us to use to be able to take our gaming experiences to a next level and really enjoy them and i have to tell you i love my gaming stuff you can see around me i think i have more gaming stuff than what 12 people would realistically need but the one thing I can tell you that I do keep separated from just my core role books, campaign settings, and everything else you see here, these are all, I'm going to call the specialty books that I have. These are the books that really help. The vast majority of them with NPCs, NPC concepts, and how to utilize NPCs into the games and make them far better. In my opinion, this has been money well spent because in the long run, it has rewarded me and not only with great gameplay, but some of these NPC concepts have actually inspired me for character creation and to make other characters. 
just cool ideas that just typically are, I'm going to say, out of the box. Just stuff typically I think most people at character creation wouldn't think about. And I don't, I'm not trying to say like that way, but typically most RPG games, when you sit down, we're just looking at template, te temples, oh, temples, jeez. <laughs> Yeah, we're all looking at temples. Oh, hell, Paylor. No, we're looking at templates of different characters is what I meant to say. You know, Barbarian or the fighter, um, the monk or the sorcerer, and so on and so forth. You know what I'm getting at. And sometimes this can make us think in a certain way and really limit us in our creative thinking when we go to make these things. Particularly when we get lost in all of the changes that are going to affect the attributes, bonuses, and how you want to rearrange them. And typically, and I'm speaking for myself, I'm not saying for everybody out there because everybody's different, I'm just speaking for myself. Typically when you get done with the character creation, you had a concept and an idea of what you wanted, but the overall final end character that you have may be slightly different from what you imagined it before. Whereas if with an NPC living, breathing in this game, whether under your control or as a reappearing NPC that may pop in and out of the storyline from time to time, offers a different glimpse and gives you a far better idea where the whole entire concept of the character is the main focal point and it's not lost rather than starting from square one knowing this is the backstory of my character this is where the character came from but this is the character class and the race that I want to use and here's my starting values here and a lot of times they're a lot lower and underpowered than what the vast majority of people imagine of the initial concept to begin with that's what I mean by the final character turned out could be different from what we originally conceived in our minds. But enough of that. Let's jump into some of the resources that are available out there that are just excellent wells of information for this. And some of them you may already have or have access to. Now, first thing I'm going to get out of the way it's the elephant in the room, and it's one of those things, I have to admit, that they have tried to, I'm going to say, it's really not an issue. I don't even want to say address the issue. I'm going to say more or less one of the things they tried to make far more convenient for the game master and for solo play works out pretty well. And we've seen this right here. And this is why I keep saying, you. Uh, in other videos I have said this more than once, the third edition Dungeon Master's Guide is by far my favorite DM guide ever put out. They do tap into some of those concepts of NPC reactions and how they will react with your characters and the worlds around them. Vague, but... Decent enough. They, You could see this is the beginning, almost, if you will, of the idea of the NPCs have to be far more than just a cookie cutout in a game system. Even the 5e DM's guide, you can see, tries to go into this. And they give you, I'm going to say, far more tables and a more robust system for it compared to 3e but i would have to just say and me this is because i love 3e i really do now i'm not saying i love this above basic ad and d because i root i wouldn't say that but for the d20 systems 3e is where it's at for me now if we get into the adventures and I have to say in the dungeon master's guide for 3e the 
area that they have for this is far more, I'm just going to say, vague, maybe the right word for it, over what 5E does, you know, offer. Well, we can see with the NPCs in the 3E is they give you far more variability by percentages. They really love to utilize the percentile dice in putting that out there. It's a decent resource, but it's not a resource that I would say would be worth going out and especially if you're not a D&D player or you know nothing about 3E, to put on your shelf if you're not going to utilize it. It would almost more or less be a book that's going to turn into what I like to call a dust collector. It's just going to sit there and completely collect dust. But what I can say is if you are a D&D player and you own any edition of D&D, the 3E Core Rulebook is an excellent resource to have considering if you look at the NPC section it gives you, it's going to give you a large wealth. Let me get to that page. I don't want to. Of NPCs to choose from by class, by race, which is no big surprise. But the thing that is cool about this is it already gives you the stats blocks already broken up and put in here along with feats saves weapons all the pertinent information you really need to know if you're utilizing them in um, a combat situation but there's a reason for that the reason for that is with this system is when the miniatures got real big, real big. And we saw them everywhere. As a matter of fact, they put out their whole entire game line of just D&D &D minis that had its own core rule book to support it. Which was cool to see this was because of the fact that it was so universal. But the tables do give you a huge wealth of NPCs, but there's a problem. It gives you all the pertinent information you need to know. But besides that, for the game, that's it. Everything else is left up to you. Whereas if you go into the 5E, the 5E begins to break this up. It's got the interaction traits, mannerisms, ideals, bonds, flaws and secrets, talents. It goes a little bit further into the NPC. Even appearances and abilities, giving you these key words, giving you more descriptions to help at that point the solo player to be able to come up with a far better, I'm going to say, concept of an NPC, more so than just being stat blocks. Now, with the NPCs, I can say this is a cool resource. It's very simple. The tables are pretty small. It's very simple to anybody to get this and utilize this for their games. It's streamlined. It's cool. I have to admit, I'm not going to downplay it whatsoever. It is cool. It is a cool idea. But here's the thing between 3E and 5E. One of them more and less really emphasizes on more so of the personality characteristics of the NPC, where the other one really emphasizes on the stat blocks that you need to know for the battlefield. Both of them are limited on either side of the spectrum of the NPC, neither one better over the other. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to NPCs, where this is left up to us to utilize our imaginations for this.
But you may be saying, where do we get this from? Well, I'm going to talk about a few books that I have here. Some that are still in print, others that are not. It may be a little pricey for you to get your hands on. And, you know, when it comes to that, never go outside your means. Always stay within your means for your hobby. It's one thing I can stress and I can tell you from experience. Mm, you're never going to get <laughs> the money out of it that you put in. That's why it's a hobby. So my best advice with this is check other resources like RPG drive through They just have a wealth of different systems on there and resources that you can find that are detailed and this is important when it comes to npcs that are detailed towards your playing style what you like that is the important thing you have to remember the first one i'm going to talk about that i have had this for a very long time it's still one of my more favorite randomized table books out there and it's good and that's why it's that is the toolbox. The toolbox covers more so than just NPCs. It's far more than that. But when we do get into NPCs, let's go to the NPC section of 172. So the NPCs, even the initial concept of them, just goes farther in out of the norm rather than what we would see at that time of just being the basic races and classes. Now, this is stretched further out. This has really gone into some, some areas you probably normally wouldn't imagine that you would use for your RPG game. Like a dock worker, or an embroiderer, or an engraver, <laughs> executioner, yeah, a falconer, a fencer, a fisherman, a forester, a fortune teller, a furrier, or a gardener. This has so many different tables onto it that can be used. And then when you go into the next section and you start really getting into this, which, my God, really started helping me many, many years ago start actually utilizing NPCs in a better way in my games. And that was NPC unique characteristics. <laughs> like six fingers on the right hand. Or chain connecting nose to belly button. White streaks only on one side of the hair. Even though these are just one line brief descriptions. What it does is it really gets your imagination going because how does it, how does this tie into the npc which ties back into your storyline how is it related how did the white streaks of hair only get on one side of the head and not the other what could have occurred for that to happen well what if the current game session you're playing the overall end of it is to face the large encounter at the end, whether it be a dragon or a demon lord or what have you, this huge monumental encounter that your characters have to level up to before they can even possibly think about challenging this thing. And what if this NPC met along the way is one of them that just happened to get a glance of this encounter and was stricken with so much fear when they escaped they just went into exile, abandoning the adventure life altogether, just so completely frightened of what they saw. They just still 
mentally cannot cope or deal with it. You see what I mean? There's different ways. Sometimes these simple, just basic descriptions can really get your imagination going to put these into your games. It went in a little bit in depth with NPC adventures. Now at this point, the NPCs were more than just a single description. Now these NPCs were actually on their own adventure where your characters at that point could interact and take it into that realm, if you will. And it went further into stat blocks, other things like that, like an orc first born barbarian of third level and just gives you all the stat blocks that you need to know to be able to build that, flesh out that NPC and utilize that into your campaign. This is a good book. It has a lot of information in it, more so than just NPCs, a lot, especially if you're new to the RPG hobby. That's just a wealth of information. Once again, why they call the book the toolbox. A couple of other ones that I have found to be very, very beneficial. The first one is the Adventure Crafter. The Adventure Crafter has it's just an absolutely amazing section on this for NPCs. Going into depth of the NPC, of the traits, the behavioral traits that they're going to have, other outlooks on the world around them, and so on and so forth. Along with this just being a great way, the way that this is absolutely structured, to teach you how to play a solo RPG, utilizing it and basing that on the overall theme of the story arc and how to tie that in. But nevertheless, it begins to hint out of the NPC. It gives you a little taste of it without really being able to sink your teeth into it, but enough to be able to develop a really good systematic system for yourself but it isn't until we get into this book right here. This is really the book that is a great one. If you're struggling with your NPCs and you're looking for a resource to really help you, to really help you think about them, how to shape them, how to really make the NPC the most that you can for your game, that is Mythic Variations too. This, I think a lot of people, when they see that, may think, oh, we're back to Mythic. No, you don't need Mythic for this. You don't need the Mythic chart. You don't need any of that. The concepts alone in the book are just spectacular enough. And the charts that they give you in here, realistically, everything that you have is all contained in here. But what you are going to get is a great, great breakdown of an NPC that's going to be basically taken on a life of its own and added into your game systems. The other one I wanna talk about that still, <laughs> all these years later, it's still my go to NPC generator. As a matter of fact, it's so great that I have photocopied the pages out of the book and put them in my own little reference gaming screen, if you will, here. Like so, to utilize all these tables when I need them. And that is the game system I'm talking about. Scarlet Heroes. Scarlet Heroes is a very unique system. It's a good system unto itself. The book itself is a self-contained RPG game and can be used. It's an OSR based in a um, Mid-Eastern, I don't want to say Middle Eastern because that's not, that, that's incorrect. We're just going to say in um reminds me of feudal Japan is what it reminds me of and 
But the cool thing is the concepts towards the back of the book, in my opinion, that's really where it shines because it has a whole entire section unto itself for solo gaming. This has a great resource to it, especially the reactions table, all for the NPCs outlining whether these are friendly strangers or just unfriendly NPCs and how they would react in certain situations. It really emphasizes on memorable traits, ruling temperaments, and even the NPCs immediate desires. It even goes further into that branching out there for the solo and gaming experience a lot more here than I'm going to get into in this video, but there's a huge wealth of information in here. This game system and the concept of it still for me today for the fact that there's so much here, but it's so simple. It doesn't slow my gameplay down. That's what I like about it. Pretty much everything on these solo charts can be resolved with 2d6, a percentile dice, or 20-sided die. Everything, typically any RPG game that you play today is going to utilize those dice. So it's not like you have to have one, two, three, or more books in order to understand all of this. No, it's all in this book alone, which is just excellent. It's outstanding. Some of the other more recent um, resources that I have seen out there, the One Ring, one of the resources they came out with was the Strider mode. The Strider mode emphasized, it had these tables on different concepts, ideas, motivations, if you will, that could be used for not only your enemies in the game and the protagonist in the game, but also the NPCs in the game. Granted, it's a, it was a very, it is a very simple system, but here's something that I found. Here's a key takeaway from this, and I say this a lot. Less is better. What do I mean by that? Sometimes a description with a few words and allow your imagination to fill in the rest is far better than having an explanation that's so long-winded that already has this pre-existed, I'm going to say, explanation of a world and motivations and everything else going on with it that may just not line up with everything you have going on in your world. And then it's, you're bogged down at that point. You've got to make alterations and changes to make it work into your world. And the line times out of 10, when you look at it, when you get done, it's going to be a far more simpler explanation when you're done than where you began. What gets me back to less is better. It really is. And that's what I've noticed with some of these resources that I have that makes them so good. Why I keep going back to them? Because they are excellent. Now, for those of you out there that are all into the 5e and you like the 5e and you're just going along with the 5e, well, you always have the DM's guide. And I can say... Don't shortchange yourself. Mythic variations and the adventure crafter can bring a lot to your game system. But if you enjoy OSR games like me, you like the older school, what they consider games, and even by today's standards, I'm going to argue 3E is old school. Damn, that means I'm getting old. But with that thought in mind, some of these resources are going to work absolutely the best, particularly Scarlet Heroes. And don't forget the toolbox. 
Now, of these two, I'm just going to say Scarlet Heroes is by far more descriptive and a superior system. The difference is this has an entire section that is detailed to solo RPG playing and gives you the resources to be able to do solo RPG playing. The toolbox was written for the Dungeon Master. It was just in a large tomb of tables and ideas that the Dungeon Master could pull out and be able to utilize at a moment's notice to keep the gameplay going. But I found a very valuable thing with this very early on, which started me down the path of all the randomized tables. You can't see them on camera over here, but I have a huge stack of books that are nothing more than just randomized tables from various different authors that I use a lot. One of them I'm going to throw out there. I don't care what edition D&D player you are. And if you like any fantasy RPG game, let me grab this. That'll be this book right here. Random Fantasy Tables 1. This is also an excellent resource for both OSR and more modern D20 systems out there that people are playing. Everything in between. Even if, heck, if you're playing D100 systems like Ruin Quest, they still are very, very excellent resources. And what's the one thing that they have in common? Well, what I can tell you, NPCs. These have, as I said, they have a can have a large overview of an NPC. But let's go to an example here so I can explain it to you so you can understand. So it says Adventure NPCs. And right here we have Kranan, the male half-elf wizard, Chaotic. Kranan has fair skin and long blonde hair. He wears a bright purple robe. Kranan is very in tune with the natural world. He is a member of a secret society known as the High Council. The High Council seeks to bring about the downfall of civilization. So, it's a decent explanation. It's a really good explanation, but it's not so over-explained that it can contradict with your storyline and it can be easily added in, but it lacks motivation. It lacks the traits, what the NPC's thinking, what his personal um, agendas are, and so on and so forth. Where it's like what I said with Scarlet Heroes, Scarlet Heroes really addresses that. It makes it very simple to be utilized both by the GM and the solo RPG player. It's so one of the things I have grappled with for a while. It's something I think a lot of people out there have when it comes to NPCs. And it's something I just want to reemphasize. And that is utilize NPCs to your advantage with your games. Look at them more or less as a resource or a tool when needed. Don't, I'm going to say... Don't shortchange yourself when it comes to the creative process of these and putting them in there. Sometimes an NPC, just for the sake that a randomized NPC had to come into the game, when it lacks description, motivation, or anything else, can actually ruin an RPG session, if not a game, offering nothing but taking everything from it. Whereas if the proper motivations, descriptions, and the overall agendas that the NPC has can enhance a game. It can take it to different areas you have never would have even imagined to begin with. Surprising you. Maybe giving you a different perspective on gaming than you have in the past of NPCs. Now, NPCs, before I run this video out, because it's quite a long video, it is, I'm going to say, a 
<laughs> it's almost like a formula, if you will. And once you get that formula, Mac, formula, once you get that formula right, you figure out exactly what you like, what really captures your imagination, and what resource it is that you like to use. It's at that point you're going to find NPCs are far more enjoyable in your game. I can say, speaking from experience, I don't dread NPCs. I actually like NPCs coming into the game. It enhances the game, in my opinion. And if you're struggling with them, perhaps that's what it is. You've just never really had them in the right setting with the right motivation to be able to enhance the game. But when you do, you will see the value behind them. Yeah. I just... NPCs. I could do probably 10 videos on NPCs, probably an hour, two hours long, and never, ever, ever really get to the bottom of the rabbit hole of NPCs. Because in fact, that's what it is. There are so many resources out there for it. But before I do round this video out, I just want to say, don't be limited by them. Don't shortchange yourself or your games. Experiment with these things a little bit. Try different um, information resources to tweak them and see how they can work best in your game systems. And then try them. Think you'll be surprised at how they work out. And like I said, these are some of the main resources I go back to a lot. Mythic Variations 2, The Adventure Crafter, Scarlet Heroes, those three being the main, and then sometimes going back to it still, I'll find myself right here in the toolbox, along with my other randomized tables that I utilize. <laughs> yeah, it all started, I can remember, when the toolbox came out. That was the most comprehensive thing I've ever seen. Before then, I had a loose leaf just filled with different randomized tables that I used. And then that came out and blew everything out of the water. And then since then, I have moved on to just books upon books like this. Randomized tables to put into my game systems. And it makes them more enriched as a result of it. All right, my friends, as I say at the end of every video, these are my thoughts and not yours. I hope you enjoyed it and let me know. Do you struggle with NPCs? Is there particular areas you're struggling with NPCs? Drop me a line in the comment and let me know. And uh, I'll see if I can help you maybe get some of those issues resolved and maybe directions I can head you into that will help you. But with that being said, this is Artichoke Dip, signing off.